on their extraordinary, extraordinary open rescues. Wayne Chung has been featured, and DXC, in the New York Times, in the Washington Post, in The Intercept, on ABC News' Night Line. And this is a man of many talent. He is brilliant. He is a law professor. He spoke and taught, was on the faculty at Northwestern School of Law. He was also a graduate fellow at MIT. What an amazing man to lead us into the next phase of the animal rights movement, Wen Shung! I put a mic on. Uh, with that intro, I feel like I should just go home. I'm basically kind of disappointed. Thank you all for being here. It's amazing being in Central California. I love coming up down here. There's some incredible sanctuaries. If you haven't been to Happy Hen, please go there. I come down to Happy Hen every occasion I can get. If you know me, you know that every time I give a talk, I try to make three points, and I try to give you a preview of what those three points are, a cue, what we're going to discuss together, and I do hope this is going to be a discussion. And at the end, I'd love to take your questions, your comments, your criticisms. But three points I'm going to try and make today are, first, rescuing animals is our duty. Second, it's not just our duty, but it's a gift that we can give to ourselves. But third, and maybe most importantly, it's a gift that we need to share with everyone around us. So let me go with the first point first. Rescuing animals is our duty. So about one week ago, I was standing in the middle of a goat farm, a goat meat farm, with a cryptocurrency millionaire, a competitive cyclist, and an IT professional with a baby goat in my arms. It was pouring down rain. There were electrified fences around us. There were barking dogs hounding us. It was this farmer about as far away as that door is from me right now with a gun. And we were hightailing it out of that farm. Now why were we doing this? Why did this motley crew of cryptocurrency millionaires, IT professionals, and competitive cyclists all come together and find ourselves in this extremely unusual and a little bit absurd situation? And it came down to one and only one word. And it guesses as to what that word might be. Love. Compassion. Compassion. Justice. But the word that I use, and that I've been using more often as a Buddhist, is another word. Anyone know that word? Ahimsa. Ahimsa. So ahimsa can be interpreted in many ways, but two of the most common interpretations for ahimsa are nonviolence and compassion. But there's a big difference between affection or love on one hand and compassion on the other. Any guesses as to what that difference might be? Yeah? Compassion is loving deeply. It's loving deeply. Good. It's something else, too, though. Any other guesses? Action. Action. Something else. It's about what is the difference between compassion and love and what, in what direction these forces and emotions are directed? Yeah? Compassion, you're actually feeling for the other. You're feeling for the other with passion, with compassion. You're trying to get inside the head of the other person. Getting very close to the answer that I'm looking for. The answer I'm looking for is that compassion and nonviolence are directed towards everyone. Love is a feeling, it's an attachment to a specific individual, 
to whom we have a personal relationship. Compassion is something we feel towards all life on this earth. And Buddhists for thousands of years have believed that all life is precious, all life is connected. And the most wise among us understand that everyone else who feels is the same feelings that we have. And so when we have love in its most highest, most pure, most powerful form, it's directed towards all those around us and not those we personally know. So that word explained why Ben, Jake, and Lewis and I were there at that farm. Because I have directed my life for the past 15 years, and those team members with me in that farm have directed their lives for the past couple of years towards one and only one mission, to give as many creatures on this earth the compassion that they deserve. Because those of you who are in this room understand that for so many of the living creatures of this earth, they have never felt even an ounce of compassion. Their lives are sadness, desolation, misery, and violence. And that was the destiny, that was the future for a little goat named Rain. Because even on the so-called humane meat farms in this nation, animals are suffering from disease, they're taken from their mothers at a very young age, and yes, they will be slaughtered mercilessly as they cry out for their families. That was Rain's future. And whether you have love or compassion for any individual, the test of that, the true test of whether you have that feeling in a genuine fashion is whether you take action to protect them. That's what we were there to do. And sometimes those actions come at a sacrifice. And for the first time in DXC's history, we live streamed this open rescue mission in the middle of a goat farm to the world. Thousands of people on Facebook saw this, and among those thousands were a large number of farmers. And so for the past week, I faced death threats, phone calls, people impersonating me on Facebook. One gentleman on Facebook who is very kind-hearted called me a homo, then a Muslim, then a goat thief, all in the same string of comments. And many people threatened to have us arrested and thrown in jail. One person even called me a terrorist. All for a simple act of compassion. Taking a baby goat who is destined for slaughter, who is suffering from pneumonia, to a vet and giving him the life he deserves. So why is this? Why do we live in a world where so many people seem so agitated against these simple acts of compassion? And the simple reason is that people are not taught to cultivate their compassion. For thousands of years, Buddhists have understood that while human beings have a natural capacity for compassion, it has to be cultivated and trained in us. Otherwise, we cannot see beyond ourselves and maybe our family members to the broader world of life in this universe. So the way I like to put it is that for most of us on this planet, when we look out into the world and we empathize with those around us, it's like we're looking at a keyhole into the darkness. If you're looking through a keyhole into the darkness, all you can see is a tiny little window into the entire universe of life. With practice and teaching and training and meditation, great Buddhist sages for thousands of years have trained themselves to see out into the brightness of the entire universe. And this is the second concept that is so important to Buddhists. Has anyone heard of this concept? Any guesses as to what the concept is? Metta. Anatta. Yeah. It's detachment from yourself. And many of you have probably heard that Buddhists believe in detaching ourselves from the material world. And understanding that we are not the only life on this earth, that all life on this earth is connected. And when you understand that yourself, your experience, your window into the universe is just a tiny cable into the entire universe, then you start looking outside of it. But that takes training. And instead of training our children to see out in the wide, beautiful universe of this world, we teach them to look only through that little keyhole and never seek out their compassion, never cultivate their love, not just for the individual in front of them, but for all the other life on this earth that may be suffering far more than you or I. And that is what we need to change. That brings me to my second point. So when I say this, a lot of people say, oh my gosh, that sounds so hard. I don't want to meditate my entire life, walk on burning hot rocks, to train myself not to feel my own pain, deny myself of these pleasures that I really believe in and that I really enjoy, whether it's food or luxury or travel. And here's the thing. Rescuing animals and cultivating compassion is not just a duty, although it is a duty. It is a gift. So my mother came to this country about 45, 50 years ago, a little bit more than that, with $40 in her pocket, barely even spoke the language, was terrified about her future, 
and walked into central Illinois, having never been outside of a tropical climate, into a winter storm. She was living utter terror for the first couple of years of her life in this country, not understanding the people, the culture, not being able to communicate with people. But she had a vision of the future that was based on her responsibility and the gift that she wanted to give her family back home in China and Taiwan. And that was the gift of life. For 50 years, my family had been decimated by a civil war in China. We had lost family members, we had lost loved ones. Some of our family members were sent to concentration camps and killed by Mao Zedong. And so for those 50 years, we lived in terror and did not know if our family would exist for another decade. And when she came to this country, she came with an immense sense of responsibility, an immense weight on her shoulders to try and give a chance to every single one of her families back at home to come to the United States and benefit from the, the wealth, the food, the security of living in the West. But she also came understanding that by taking on this responsibility, she was giving herself a gift and a gift to those she loved most as well. We need to understand this about our obligations to the other life and serve. That it's not just a responsibility, but a gift. And I can say this from personal experience. Taking an animal out of hell, taking a shivering baby goat out of a slaughterhouse, taking a poor piglet who's being trampled to death and cannibalized out of a massive factory farm in Utah is the most powerful and beautiful experience of my life. And this is why people like cryptocurrency millionaires, competitive cyclists, actors and actresses, and even soon probably politicians will be joining us and in going into these hell holes and taking animals out because you come out feeling different, transformed, and powerful in a way that you never felt before. Has anyone heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? What is the highest level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Self-actualization. Self Feeling that you're living your life in alignment with your values, that your purpose in life has been fulfilled. It's a funny thing, psychologists and sociologists talk to people at the end of their life over and over again. They've done interviews for hundreds of years. And they ask them, what do you regret most in your life? And guess what people said? They never say, oh, I wish I'd worked more. They never say, I wish I'd made more money. They never say, I wish I'd spent more time and money on myself. They say over and over and over again, from all different cultures, from all creeds, all nations, I wish I had done something that mattered. I wish I had done something that mattered. And just think back through history at the important and crucial moments in American history, or frankly in the history of this planet. Think about the civil rights movement, the women's suffrage movement, the American Revolution and the Civil War. Think about these crucial moments in history and ask yourself, if you live in a time where you could fight for something so important so beautiful that the survival of life on this earth depended on it. Who would not feel impassioned and empowered and inspired to take on that fight? So joining this fight to rescue animals, while it might feel like a burden, is actually a gift. And so people often ask me, how do you go into these factory farms? How do you go into these slaughterhouses? How do you bear these risks of farmers and razor wire fences and barking dogs and police and FBI agents saying you're a terrorist? And I say, I come out every single time with a big smile on my face because I know we are changing the world. What? And that, that is the most beautiful gift I can give myself. Yeah. So that's the second point. And here's the third point. When we have something that is an incredible gift for ourselves and those we love, if we truly believe in a hymn, if we believe in compassion, if we believe in love, not just for our family, not just for romantic partners, but for all life on this earth, then we have to give it everything. Don't hold on to these gifts. If you had a cure for cancer, and you knew there are millions of people across the world, if they had your knowledge, if they had this little dose of medicine that could save their lives, who among us would not give this freely across the entire earth? Well, we are at a point, folks, where the systems of violence and degradation, animal agriculture, fossil fuel companies, industrial capitalism, are a cancer on this earth. Over 1.5 million species are currently being threatened with extinction. Trillions of individual animals, individual families, individual children and mothers are starving to death, dying of diseases, being burned alive because of deforestation, because of these powerful systems of violence controlled by corporations 
who have no interest in benefiting the world or you or I. These things are happening, and we have a cure. The animal rights movement, the environmental movement, progressive movements challenging the power of money with the power of people can stop these powerful institutions of violence. And we have to offer that cure to everyone around us. Because time and time again through history, whenever the forces of evil and exploitation have mobilized against the people, the only cure, and the most effective cure, has been the people coming together, speaking out, and rising up. And it is high time we started doing that for life on this earth. So there's, a, there's an interesting study that's been done and replicated many, many times, where I think it was Harvard psychologists did this the first time. And I think it was recently some psychologists at the University of British Columbia did this. And they give two sets of students $20 each. And to the first set of students, they say, spend this $20 on your son. And the students go out, they buy coffee, get a meal for themselves, go see a movie. And the other set of students who say, take this $20, go do something good for the world. Find someone, a random stranger on the street, offer them a coffee, buy them a donut, buy them a meal, take them into a movie, or give them two movie tickets for free. And these psychologists then go back a week later and talk to these two students. And something really interesting happens. While most of the students, when asked ahead of time on their own, would you rather have the $20 for yourself, or would you rather be forced to give that $20 to make the world a better place? The students routinely say, oh, I'd rather spend it on myself. You know? I mean, I may not want to admit this, but you know, I need money, I want to go see the movies, I've got to buy a meal for myself. When students are actually told that they have to spend that money on some charitable purpose, one week later, they are happier, more productive, and more peaceful people than the $20, than the students who spent the $20 on themselves. So this is a gift that we can share, because what we're offering the world is so much more valuable than $20 to buy a couple movie tickets or have a meal. This is a cure to the dangers that, endang that, that are threatening life as we know it. And we need to share this wider. And this is what we try to do at DXC. Even the folks who are attacking us, who are trying to undermine or destroy us, we engage in dialogue and try to help them understand that we're not trying to hurt them. We're trying to offer them a gift. So a funny thing happened. Among the dozens or hundreds of comments that I got after we did this rescue on Facebook Live was a woman by the name of Lane. And Lane initially was quite irritated at me. She is a farmer herself. She believes in sustainable, humane meat. And one of the first comments she made on my Facebook page was, I'm going to shoot you in your narrow ass if I ever see um, But I, I talked to Lane on Facebook. I made a couple comments. I sent her a private message. And I said, I'd like to hear your perspective. Because I felt that what I was offering her was not a competition. It wasn't a challenge. It wasn't an attack on her. It was a gift. And so I shared with her my values, my background as a Buddhist, my commitment to Himsa and compassion to all life on this earth. And a funny thing happened. She started agreeing. She started understanding that our values were not nearly in as much tension as we thought. That she believed in humane animal agriculture because she believed that sustainability depended on the manure from animals. That she believed in killing animals for food because she believed that her health and her life depended on eating animals. In short, we needed to have a conversation, not a fight. And so what we at DAC do is we challenge these big, evil, oppressive systems of violence. But when we talk to individuals, we try to have as much compassion as possible and show them that what we're doing is not trying to undermine them, not trying to put them out of a job, not trying to destroy their livelihood or their families or their food. We're trying to give them a gift. But to do that, we have to have the humility to understand that they may have some gifts to offer in return. And in fact, Lady did have some gifts to offer. She educated me about the importance of topsoil. She educated me about the dangers to ocean life. And in fact, she was, well, not a vegetarian, but decided to stop eating all sea life because of the danger being posed to the oceans by the massive overfishing in our oceans, lakes, and streams. So we engaged in this exchange. We understood that we had things to offer each other. And by the end of the conversation, Lena had posted on Facebook that she had a wonderful interaction with me, 
that she was going to ask everyone in her Facebook group to stop attacking vegans, and that it was time for us all to work together to challenge Big Ad. But the reason this happened, the reason this happened, the reason we have conversations like this with slaughterhouse workers, with factory farmers, with retailers, maybe corporate CEOs, is because whenever we go in, the more aggressive the tactic we use, the more compassionate our messaging to the individuals involved. And so we can go into a slaughterhouse, take it over, shut it down, start taking the animals out, but have lunch with the owner afterwards. We can shut down a grocery store like Whole Foods and challenge the lies and deception and violence at the root of their profit model, but then sit down with the managers of the grocery store afterwards and hear their concerns about privacy, about disruption of their business, and about their employees' livelihoods. We need to have conversations. And so many of us have probably seen on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, that in today's social media climate, we're not having those conversations for us. We're yelling at each other. Frankly, we're often not even yelling at each other. We're yelling past each other. We need to stop. We need to put down our keyboard, keyboards. Put down the megaphones. And again, this is the founder of Direct Action Everywhere saying, you gotta put your megaphone down sometimes. <laughs> put down your megaphones and start sitting down face to face. So Cynthia Chavez, another one of my heroes, who's also a huge proponent of nonviolence, was fond of saying that social change happens one conversation at a time. It's not the leaders, it's not the grand strategies, it's not the beautiful visuals and photographs that we often attribute social change to that actually create change. Social change starts from the ground up, and it starts with one-to-one -one conversations. It starts with all of you giving the gift of your knowledge, your expertise, your experience, your personal biography to all those around you. And if we give that gift, we give it freely, even to mediators, even to factory farmers, even to corporate CEOs, that, and only that, is when we will start creating change. So this is why we do what we do at DX. And people ask, why are you breaking these farms and don't even cover your face? Why do you share with the world publicly these so-called unlawful, illegal, terroristic activities? And it's because what we're trying to do is start conversations. And whoever has had a conversation with someone with a mask on their face, and you have to be the same. While you might not be engaged in access to disobedience, although I'd love for you to join us in taking those access to disobedience, take your mask off. Be proud, but love it in your veganism, in your vegetarianism, in your animal advocacy, in your vinylism, and invite people to join you in creating a movement to change the entire world. And I'm going to give you one concrete way that all of us can come together right now to try and change this world, and that is the right to know. Because whether you're a meat eater, or a vegetarian, or a vegan, or an animal rights activist, all of us understand the importance of transparency. We live today in a world where large corporations control so much of our lives. Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Exxon, Chevron, Whole Foods, Tyson, Smithfield. These multi-billion dollar companies have unprecedented levels of control and wealth. All of our individual wealth combined is just a drop in the bucket compared to the amount of wealth held by large corporations and corporate coffers. And there is a vicious cycle between the government and these corporations that keeps the people uninformed, ignorant, and downtrodden. We need to stop that cycle. And the best way to do that is to bring out what's happening in the dark into the light. And when we talk to mediums, when we talk to small business people, when we talk to small-time farmers like Lena about this issue, about transparency in the system, they all agree we need to shine light in the dark. Because after all, if the people don't even know the truth, if we don't have the basic facts on the table, about what's happening to the planet, what's happening to all the species that are being exterminated, what's happening to individual animals no different than our dogs or cats in factory farms, and we don't even have those facts, how the heck are we going to make informed decisions or make change? There's something happening right now that's extremely concerning. These large corporations understand the threat being posed by transparency, so they will do anything, and I mean absolutely anything, to crush those of us who are trying to bring light to the dark. Anyone heard of the ag gag laws? Yes. What's the ag gag law? Or what are the ag gag laws? You're prevented, you're prevented from going um, in and recording anything and then publicly showing it. The ag gag laws have criminalized the simple act of taking a <coughs> photograph when the photograph is of animal abuse. 
So we all know about the First Amendment. The First Amendment is the first and most important in the Bill of Rights. When our founding fathers came together and said, what is crucial to democracy? What is the lifeblood of democracy? What is the most necessary element of a well-functioning society? It was the freedom of speech, the freedom of the press, that we would be able to say what we want without being punished. These corporations not only are endangering life on this planet and killing off animals left and right, they are threatening our most basic civil liberties because they know that if the people speak, then things will change. But the only way for us to stop this is not to depend on politicians to do the right thing. Because there are good politicians, and most politicians are worried first and foremost about their own electoral survival. And when $120 million, $120 million are going straight from corporate coffers into politicians' hands, they are not going to make the change without us rising up. So we have to rise up. We have to speak out and say, I have the right to know. My family has the right to know. I have the right to know what is going into my kids' bodies. And I want you to join us in this crusade, in this fight to create transparency and integrity, not just in our food system, but in our entire political system. But it starts right here and right now, because every single one of you has that power. Every single one of you has a House member, has a city council person, has a senator who is beholden to you. And every time I talk to a politician, and we passed laws recently in California and around the country, in support of animal rights and violence. Every time I have a conversation with one of these politicians, the thing they say over and over again that makes a difference for them is when people walk in their door. Because when someone is so motivated, so impassioned, so angry, that they're willing to walk into that politician's door, then that politician's gonna assume there's 10,000 other people just as motivated to vote the same way at the next electoral cycle. So let's start making change. And if you haven't heard about it, I encourage all of you to look up the Compassionate Cities campaign that DAC has launched with the Save Movement in Defense of Animals. Our goal is to take a step-by-step -step process from here to an animal bill of rights, with the first step being the right to know. The right for citizens, vegans and non-vegans alike, to know what is happening behind those closed doors. Because once we see what's behind those closed doors, we'll be disturbed. We'll be outraged, and we will create change. So let me just wrap up. I started with the duty of rescue. That for those of us who are Buddhists, but frankly, those of us from all walks of life, whether you're Christian or Jewish or Muslim or Hindu, every religion, every great cultural and ethical tradition in human civilization is believed in compassion. That we have an obligation to help those in need around us, especially when they're facing egregious violence. But that obligation, that duty, is not just a duty, it's a gift. And in fact, time and time again, the most actualized and fulfilled human beings on this earth say that they became powerful, transformed, fulfilled people because they understood their responsibilities to help others were benefiting themselves. And third and finally, we have to give this gift, this responsibility to those around us. When we go out there and talk to our friends and family members, don't blame and shame them, don't attack them, don't tell them they're bad. Invite them warmly into a world and a future where all life on this earth, including them and their families and their children, and all life on this earth is nourished and protected. If we do this, or I should say when we do this, because I believe a movement is rising up to do this, change will happen. It's going to happen far sooner than you think. Mark my words, 40 years from today, I believe fiercely with my life that we will come before the U.S. Congress and pass a constitutional bill of animal rights that gives all the sentient beings of this earth, not just human beings, but all the lives on this earth, the right to be safe, happy, and free. But only if we see our responsibility, our gift, and our opportunity to share. Thank you very much. that some local activists, including Zoe Rosenberg, the founder of Happy Hen Chicken Rescue, are doing a march for animal rights right after the Veg Fest. And this is a great opportunity to start giving this gift. Right? Taking advantage of the gift yourself, because when you take action, you feel fulfilled and, and dramatized and empowered by that action, but then you can share it with those around us. This is going to be a nonviolent, peaceful march. Zoe's going to be leading it. I'll be there. Many of the other DAC members who are here will be there as well, and hopefully you can join as well. It's going to be a 6 p.m. meeting right outside the Veterans Hall.
I actually don't know. Where are we going to march to? Are they City Hall? Mission Plaza. Mission Plaza. Yeah. And, and I could go into this as well, but there's incredible power of numbers. That if you look